like we're sitting down and talking today. Uh, I'd like to thank Tony uh, God for inviting me here to give my talk. And, um, when he did invite me here, he suggested that I could talk on one of two topics because I've got two recent papers published. One is an evaluation of the uh, research assessment exercise in the UK, and the other is a more general introduction to science and metrics. Um, but what I actually decided to do is to talk about both. <laughs> um, which means I might have to talk quickly, uh, but anyway, uh, because I think the two are, are strongly related to each other. Um, uh, this is broadly what I'm going to talk about today. The first few uh, topics concern this thing called the research assessment exercise, which takes up more and more time of universities in the United Kingdom, and then the second part of the talk will be an introduction to, in a very general broad sense, uh, the area of scientometrics, which no doubt uh, the two later speakers may well uh, elaborate on. Um, so, the Research Excellence Framework, uh, is, as it is now called, um, this started in the United <coughs> Kingdom uh, in, in 1986, when the UK government, who provide a lot of money to UK universities, at the time did so in a very ad hoc way. They didn't really have any particular method for doing it. And they decided that they needed something more accountable to be able to allocate their money. And so they initiated what was a very small, what they called a research selectivity exercise, purely in order to decide how to give out their money to universities. Uh, and at that first one, it was unbelievably to us now, each department in each university submitted simply five papers, five papers they thought were good, and a description of their research. And that was all that they had to give And uh, results of that, um, they had a peer review panel who uh, ranked the various departments from below average to outstanding. And it was really very little interesting in the universities. I remember at the time I was at Warwick Business School and we didn't really pay much attention to it. Uh, until after the results came out and the Times Higher Education uh, Journal, as it was then, produced a ranking of universities based on these results. And this ranking was very interesting because uh, it generated results which were not what was expected, in the sense that certain universities, such as Warwick, where I was, which was a relatively modern university which didn't have a long history, actually did very well in this ranking and some of the traditional universities were much further down. So at that point, it generated a large amount of interest uh, from the universities because they could see the direct effects of such a measurement model. Um, and from then on, there have been six more from 1989 to 2014, I should say, not 2104, we haven't quite got there yet. Um, but there have been six more, which have become ever more complex ever more time consuming and ever more dominating of how universities decide what they can do and the pressures that they put on that limits. So the 2014, what's now called the Research Excellence Framework, was estimated to have cost overall £250 million pounds to carry out in terms of the amount of time spent by all people throughout the sector in doing it. And I would argue that it's the biggest driver of university behaviour uh, that there is, and it is having major, has major effects on the whole sort of research community and research culture we have. Um, I have experienced it from a number of different angles. For the first few, I was simply an academic whose work was evaluated and judged, and who was put into a submission. But in 2008, I was the director of research for the business school, which meant that I was in charge of all of our research and in charge of the submission to the business school. So I had managerial responsibility for it then. And in 2014, I was also the dean and director of the business school. So I had even more managerial responsibility for it. Uh, and I found that this has given me a very um, schizophrenic attitude towards it. Because on the one hand, uh, there are many aspects of it, particularly its managerial implications, which I strongly disagree with, as we will see. But on the other hand, I was in the position of having to do those things. Um, and that puts you in a very, very difficult position as an academic. 
and of course you have to do the best that you can for your department, for your university, and yet at the same time you find yourself doing things that you don't really believe you should do. Um, so let's just, I'll just briefly give you, tell you how the thing works, just to give you an impression of the huge complexity and, um, and uh, time-consuming nature of it. So this is the 2014 model. Every department uh, in every university has to make a submission to the REF. And that submission consists of three things. Firstly, it consists of research outputs. And one has to submit four outputs <coughs> per academic that you are choosing to submit. If you submit less than four outputs, say three for a particular academic, they will still score the fourth one and then you give it a mark of zero. So you absolutely don't do that. You can only put in academics for whom you feel that you've got four good quality papers. You also have to submit a research environment statement which describes your research strategy. So that's your story. Uh, much of it fictional, um, but some of it not fictional. That's your description. And then for the first time in this session, this week, we also have to present the impact of our research in the non-academic fields. So every department, no matter what their nature of the research was, had to present case studies of <coughs> how their research was having an impact in the external world. So whether you're in business management like I am, or whether you're in philosophy, you nevertheless have to show what impact your research had. Now that's a whole other thing, I'm not going to talk about that full today, but it uh, obviously uh, was very significant. Um, those three things uh, were each scored on a scale from 0 to 4 star. Now, 0 means unclassified, and then the others are supposedly increasing degrees of quality. So, uh, 1 star, 2 star, 3 star is, is the sort of better level of quality, where it is quality that is internationally excellent, and 4 star is the top level, which everybody uh, aspires to, which is quality that is supposed to be world leading in terms of originality. And as I say, those quality scales were applied to every single output that was submitted to the left. They were also applied to the, uh, the research environment description, and they were also applied to the case studies that one had to submit. Uh, so the end results were that on each of these three uh, aspects, each department was given a profile. It wasn't given a single number. It was given a profile, which was the percentage of their research which were considered to be in those various categories. <coughs> um, so you can see all that from here. Uh, we've got over here what the components of the submission were. Staff data, research outputs, impact case studies, research environment, PhD data, etc. And these quality profiles along here were what were generated by the panel. So for outputs, here we've got the percentages that were considered to be four star, three star, two star, and one star. Uh, similarly for impact, similarly for environment. And those three elements were then combined together in a weighted way, 65% to outputs, 20% to impact, 15% to environment, uh, to create the overall profile for the particular submission, that is for the particular department. So in this department we can see that the overall aggregation suggested that 12% of its research was supposedly four-star world, top level international, 37% three-star, 41% two-star, 10% one-star. And so that is the results that were given from the exercise. Uh, they deliberately don't give you the actual scores that were given to individual papers, they just give you the overall profile. And part of the reason for giving a profile like this was to avoid, from the, their point of view, um, assigning a department to a single score. However, as you can imagine, trying to create a lead table from a profile like that is quite difficult, and so immediately the Times Higher converts that overall quality profile into an average, into a mean. Uh, in 4, 3, 2, 1 weighted by the percentages. To get um, the overall mean or GPA as we call it, grade point average for that particular <coughs> department. 
So uh, this is quickly converted into a grade point average by the times higher, and they then immediately produce a league table based on that grade point average, um, which then has perceived by universities huge effects in terms of their reputation. Uh, as I said originally, it was intended purely to dish out the government's money. That has become a much less important thing as far as universities are concerned now, because quite frankly for many universities, <coughs> the amount of money that they receive is quite small. So it is the reputational effects on the university which is much greater. Um, now two other, well, another major change that has occurred through the cycle is that more and more weight has been placed on the four star journals. In the first uh, exercises, one star and two star and three star were given some weight uh, in terms of funding, but as it's gone on, it has got ever more towards four stars. So that in the last uh, REF, um, I think there was a small amount of weight for three stars, mostly for four stars, and in the next one it will probably only be for four stars. So this has the effect of forcing everybody's attention onto attempting to get research outputs, papers, in what are considered to be the world leading journals. And if you're an academic, nowadays, to be honest, uh, three star papers are okay, that's the minimum really that you need to be aiming for. But you're really trying to get four star papers. And things that low three star are considered to be um, not much use. The question, of course, is how do we know whether a paper is four star, three star, two star, or one star? Uh, which is the issue. So that's um, how it works. Just to give you an idea of how big it is, uh, in 2014, there were uh, 36 different panels. In other words, 36 different subjects had a panel of their own. They were split into four main panels, which roughly can coincide with clinical medicine, <coughs> science, social science, and humanities, broadly speaking. So they were the four main panels. Um, and in total, in these 36 sub-panels, there were 1,000, roughly, um, panel members, basically academics and a few external people as well. Um, so that seems like a lot of people, but if you look at how much they have to evaluate, uh, there were 154 universities, 2,363 departments <coughs> submissions, uh, 57,000 staff were submitted, but look at this one, 215,000 papers were submitted and had to be evaluated onto a scale of 0 to 4. And those 215,000 had to be evaluated by 1,000 assessors. So that, if you just take the overall average, is about 200 papers per assessor. And actually, if you look at business and management, which is my own area, and which is the biggest single area, there were actually 12,200 uh, outputs just into business and management. <coughs> there were 23 people on the panel, which averages at 600 papers each. So these four panel members had about two months to come up with a 0 to 4 evaluation of 600 people. Now imagine trying to do that yourself, and you'll see to what extent you can possibly read and properly evaluate papers at that level. It's just not possible. Um, so that is the thing. What I want to talk about are what I consider to be the dysfunctional effects of that process. Um, the really bad effects that it has on research in general. Uh, I want to begin actually with a slightly different um, approach to this, uh, which is quite recently Derek Sayer, who was a professor of history at Lancaster, produced a book which is a, another scathing critique of the left uh, called Rank Hypocrisies. Um, but he, his critique is of a slightly aimed at a slightly different direction to mine. His critique is does this actually constitute a proper peer review system? Um, because it obviously claims to be peer reviewed, obviously has academics reviewing things, but does it conform to what one might consider as a proper, open, uh, representative system of peer review? And he comes up with a lot of problems uh, <coughs> with it as a system of peer review, particularly things like the secretive and opaque nature of the appointment of panel members, the extent to which panels merely represent the status quo, uh, the fact that panels don't have the necessary expertise to properly evaluate the full range of material, etc. So that is, I think, a very interesting book um, to look at 
in terms of whether it is actually good peer review. But my own criticisms are slightly different. They are about the effects of the REF, even were it to be a properly constituted peer review system, as it is set up. It doesn't, I'm not, these largely result from the way the REF itself is set up, its particular characteristics, rather than peer review in general. Um, so, uh, this is the diagram that's in my paper, a kind of influence diagram, I'm not going to have time to go through all of it today, in which I try to trace out uh, what I think are these negative effects on research. And just broadly speaking, oops, over here, the things in square boxes are the characteristics of the ref, which could be different, but lead to it, I think, having very low effects. Firstly, this grading system which requires us to evaluate every single output. <coughs> Secondly, the selectivity of outputs, the fact that we are only allowed to submit four outputs and therefore we have to actually choose as managers which outputs we're going to submit. And especially, selectivity of staff. One of the aspects of the REF is that when you come to make your submission, um, there are no limits either way on how many staff you put in. Uh, and the problem is that the more staff you put in, the more uh, less good research you're going to have to put in. And so when they come to produce your overall results, you are going to reduce the scores that you will get. On the other hand, if you become very selective and just put in your top few researchers, your top excellent papers, you will get a very good score. So built into the whole process is this idea that the more selective you become, the better score, which seems to me a very strange situation. Uh, but it is that, in many ways, which leads to many of the effects that we have within the department about trying to assess individuals' papers, trying to outguess the ref panel in terms of deciding what scores they would get, and on that basis, then either submitting people or not. And if you're an academic who's worked away producing papers in reasonable quality journals, then you don't get submitted to the ref. That is quite a black mark in your career, essentially. So those three things down there are major problems. <coughs> there are others down here in boxes, such as the differential funding between the grades, the fact that outputs can be transferable, um, so that one of the aspects of it is that uh, an academic takes their papers with them. So this opens up the transfer market in high quality academics between the universities. And coming up to the ref submission time, um, there is a huge competition between universities trying to grab the top researchers because they bring their papers with them. And there are many instances of universities employing a top researcher, often from overseas, for uh, a period of a month before the submission of the ref. Uh, they're not there all the time. They just grab someone who got some nice four-star publications. We'll pay you a load of money to be associated with our university for a few months and then off you go. Um, so there's a huge transfer mark in this um, and such like. So these are the aspects of the ref which I think are, have bad effects and could be changeable. And these are the sort of effects that they have in their lives. The suppression of innovation in terms of generating new ideas, uh, salami slicing of research projects, much less practical case study work and interdisciplinary work is uh, much harder to get the results for. As well as this, it leads to a whole set of problems for journals, if they're not considered to be three-star or four-star. Uh, this transfer market for researchers, a major split within departments between the research active staff who get submitted and the teaching staff who don't. And the research staff who don't get submitted then get often forced to become teaching staff so that they don't appear to be researchers. Um, so there's a whole set of uh, problems which occur. Um, just to discuss a few of those. Selectivity of staff and outputs, which is perhaps the major problem. As I said, any number of staff may be entered, and the fewer the number, the higher the GPA you will get. In 2008, most research intensive departments, certainly in my field of business management, tried to submit a lot of people. They tried to submit up to 80% of their research active staff. But a few didn't. A few well known institutions were selected and they were rewarded by the system in getting very good grades. So this led 
everybody to change their strategy for the 2014 one and to say, well, if being selected is what gets the good grades, we're going to become selective. Um, so in 2014, most university departments in business management anyway had a threshold for somebody to be submitted to the REF of at least four by three star papers. Um, as I say, the issue is how do you judge whether the paper is three star or not? Um, but that's what the sort of language was. Have you got your four three-star papers yet? Have you got your 12 points? Because if you haven't, you probably won't be submitted. Um, there are other measures that you can take, apart from simply the mean score, the GPA, uh, which do take into account the number of staff that you submit. So one that is available is called the power, which is the GPA times the number of staff submitted. And the second is called intensity. <coughs> which is the GPA times the percentage of staff that we submit. And um, other league tables were produced based on those, uh, rank those rankings as well. Um, but let's look at some examples of what people did. Um, Cardiff Metropolitan University, which is a low-level university in ex-polytechnic in UK's terms, um, in terms of the whole university rankings, not departments, came 41st out of 150 universities. That was an incredible result for them. But they only submitted 35 members of staff for the whole university. Now that seems to me a total nonsense that a university can submit only 35 staff simply to get a very good ranking. Uh, London School of Economics, a very good university, came third overall in the GPA tables. But when you worked out the power tables based on how many actual staff they submitted, they went down to 28. Um, in business and management, some submissions were very low. For example, those ones, 40%, 50% only submitting of their staff. Uh, Cardiff Business School is one of the worst offenders in this way. Uh, they came sixth on GPA, but 32nd on intensity. So they went down to that many ranking. Brunel, on the other hand, went the opposite way. Uh, they were 65th on GPA because they put in a big submission of people uh, and when you took that into account they went up to 20. Um, so there are huge differences in the rankings depending on these things. And in fact it, it became quite ludicrous because, sorry, what do you do with multi-author papers? Um, they can be submitted, if, if the authors come from different institutions, they can be submitted by each of those authors. If they come from the same institution, you can only submit it once. What if you're the second author? Well, it's up to the institution as to which person you give it to. So you have little battles as to who's paid for that. Um, but what this meant was that because there are three different ways of measuring the results, GPA, power, and intensity, and there are also the three different components of outputs, impact, and research environment, universities could, in their publicity, <coughs> choose which of those was best for them. Yeah. And as a prime example, Warwick Business School, which is where I used to be, had on its website, we were fifth in the ref. When you looked at it, what they actually were was fifth on GPA, only on outputs. So it wasn't that they were overall, <coughs> they had just chosen one thing. And so all the universities now can choose out of a vast range of different possibilities, <laughs> whichever one suits them best. <laughs> there is no one overall ranking mode. And the Times Higher actually, give, you know, they've been one of the people who's all generated this by their tables, actually themselves, after the initial GPA table, brought out a table based on intensity, and they themselves said they thought that was a fair measure, because that did actually take into account the percentage of people that you actually um, included. Uh, and I think as we go forward into future ones, I think that will be more the case. I think there is generally accepted now that GPA is too manipulable and you need something like intensity. The problem with that is, if you take intensity, i.e. Like the percentage of staff submitted, it should be the percentage of staff who do research. So the game to play then is, anybody you're not going to submit, you change their contract and say, oh, you're teaching only, you don't do research anymore. Um, so again, just another game to play. Um, there are other of these problems. Um, perhaps one of the biggest ones for business and management <coughs> is how do you decide what your quality of journal papers is? Because this is what all the schools have to do in order to decide who to submit and which papers to submit. And in uh, business and management, we have had this thing called the Association of Business Schools Journal List, 
which became the de facto and arbiter of what quality of paper was. Now, it's just a list of journals. It lists the journals that it lists in 1, 2, 3, and 4. It obviously doesn't include all of the journals that exist. So if you publish in journals that aren't in the ABS list, you are automatically given a bad mark for that. Um, shouldn't happen, but that's the way it is. Oh, it's not an ABS journal. Even though it could be one of the most highly reputable journals in some field, which is you know, key to our business and management, nevertheless, it's not an ABS media bad mark. Uh, and the other problem is that there are a huge number of criticisms of the ABS list, particularly for the extent to which it is dominated by largely American journals, um, which have particular research approaches uh, at the expense of, say, European journals, which have a wider range of acceptable research. So it leads to this hegemony of these are the top journals because that's what the ABS list says. So everybody has to try to get their papers into those few journals, which, as I say, are largely American government. Um, so that has had huge effects on the way that people do research. And largely to that, I think, which has led to the suppression of innovation. When I was first starting out as a PhD student and as an early researcher, um, I was doing stuff which was at the time quite um, seen as quite extreme, quite non-mainstream. Um, but nobody minded me doing that because as long as I could find some journal and publish it somewhere, that was all right. And what then happened was that the stuff that I was doing at the time became much more mainstream. But initially, it wasn't. Um, but nowadays, you can't let young researchers do that. Uh, as a director of research or as a PhD supervisor, when a young member of staff is starting, uh, if they're you know, doing very innovative stuff, you know it won't get published in the top mainstream journals. And therefore, you have to tell them, look, before you do that, you need to get some uh, papers in proper ABS journals. Much as you don't like doing it, that is what all the pressures need you to do. Um, so it then stops you doing innovative research, which might be groundbreaking, which might be you know, very much outside the conventional model. Uh, everything becomes very incremental, very much, can I get another management science paper, what do I have to do to get into that journal? And the journals themselves are highly dis disciplinary focused in the main, and so again, that leads to, uh, or goes against interdisciplinary work, uh, because if it's interdisciplinary, it probably won't get accepted by one of the top disciplinary journals. Um, and it also <coughs> marginalizes practical work, because generally, the top journals like theoretical work. If you do a very interesting case study in some real world organisation and you then try to write that up and get that published in the top journal, you probably won't do because they will want theory rather than empirical work. I've had several papers of mine which were actually sort of empirical analyses of the ref and such like, uh, desk rejected by journals saying, well, we don't publish empirical material like this. We want theory. Um, so uh, in my own department, uh, it ended up with two different sorts of researchers. There were the researchers who engaged themselves with outside organisations, who had impact case studies, which we submitted to the REF, uh, which were very good because they talked about real impacts they were having with real organisations, but who didn't have high quality academic journals and papers in the top journals, so we actually couldn't submit them as researchers into the REF, even though we had their case studies submitted. And on the other hand, the academics who did hit the top journals almost never actually engaged with real organisations outside. And so there were the researchers who did real engagement but we couldn't submit. And the ones we did submit, they never involved themselves in outside organisations. So it's again yeah, totally uh, destructive, I think. Um, the other thing, of course, particularly to do with the ABS, is the destruction of the journal ecosystem. Because nowadays in business and management, if your journal is only graded as a two or a one in ABS, Nobody has to send their papers there because everybody is so fixated on getting the three and four star papers. So many journals, and particularly new journals or innovative journals, as they come out, are not in the ABS list. So how do you get established as a new journal going into a new frontier of knowledge? And so these are some of the many problems with um, the effects of this particular system. And so that led me to make some recommendations in my paper, which really lead into bibliometrics. Because my view is that the first thing that one should do is to forget all about this selectivity and instead 
allow assessment of all of the full-time members of staff of a particular department, whether they are supposed to be research active or not research active, or do a bit of research, or maybe write the occasional paper, whatever. And it should also include all the research outputs that have been produced over a particular time. Uh, so then that would do away with all of this selectivity and all of these decisions needed to be made on things like the ABS list. The trouble is that it would be completely impractical if you were doing it by peer review as you do at the moment. Because you've seen the amount of work involved in the current system, uh, it would simply be impossible to assess all research by all staff. And that leads me therefore to suggest that one would need to use bibliometrics significantly within such a process, uh, subject to peer review of those results. But nevertheless, but what one needs is a much more metric based system. Now that's quite difficult at the moment, I think, um, because as we'll see in a minute, uh, there are very big differences in the extent to which there is high quality bibliometric data between the sciences, the social sciences, and the arts. So at the moment, it's not that I think possible to do it straightforwardly uh, in the social sciences and the arts, although it probably is in the science. I think the other thing that should be necessary is that we should establish a national database of all research outputs from all institutional repositories so that we don't have to have this massive great effort every five or six years. All the stuff is available, it has metrics with it, it has everything there, and it may make it very much easier to actually um, do this sort of uh, analysis. So that is the end of the first part, uh, which leads then into the second part. Um, which is a sort of general overview of scientometrics. There's a lot of terms, scientometrics, bibliometrics, etc. Um, but broadly speaking, they are concerned with a quantitative study of published or recorded information. Uh, scientometrics being concerned with scientometric information. Um, and in terms of evaluating research, it really is centered around taking the number of times a paper has been cited as a surrogate for its quality. Now, in terms of scientometrics, the citation is really the heart of what scientometrics and bibliometrics is about. Because uh, what you need to envisage this is as a network uh, in which each output, each paper, is a node in that network, and the citations that that paper makes to other papers uh, constitute the links of that network. And it is that citation which connects up these different things. It connects up not only the papers, but also the authors of the papers, the institutions, <coughs> the authors, the subjects of the paper, and the journals themselves. So citations provide the link between all of these things in a complex network. Um, now, one could say that citations really concern impact, which is not quite the same as quality. And I think that's certainly true. Um, a paper could be cited because it is wrong, and that, and that sometimes happens. Equally, many papers are never cited. Uh, we'll see some data on this in a minute. Uh, but is that therefore the fact that some paper has been published and has never been cited? Does that mean that it's worthless, that it has more quality? Well, not sure. Uh, there are problems with recording or measuring citations, especially in the social sciences, and I'm sure and we'll talk more about that in a bit. Uh, Scientometrics as a discipline really started back in the 1950s when Eugene Garfield established what was called, or still is called, the Science Citation Index. And his idea was not actually to use citations for measuring anything. What he wanted to do was to provide an alternative way of researchers uh, searching in literature to find interesting material. Uh, and what the Citation Index did was to list all the references in papers so that if you knew somebody who had written in the area, you could look up their name and then go back <coughs> and find out all the papers that it cited. And I can remember when I was a PhD student, 35 years ago, going to the library and picking up these huge great tomes because they were very big, the science citation index, it's like that, you hardly lift it off the shelf, which had all of these hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pages of references in it. And you'd look up, take the author you're interested in, and you could look up their name, and you could find all the other papers that had cited that author. And so it was a very interesting and useful thing from that point of view. Um, and that was its original. Um, Purpose. But from that, it led to the Science Citation Index, the Web of Science, and what we now know, know as the Web of Science, the Web of Knowledge, uh, which um, 
and now basically documents and numbers of citations of papers. Yes. Uh, and through to the current day, where developments emerge are very much in what's called thought metrics, which is actually alternatives to citations, all of the uh, types of metrics that you can get from social networking types of um, origins rather than simply academic citations. So, where do citations come from? I'm not going to talk a lot about this because that's really the subject of our Mills paper. Um, but essentially, there are two main databases which are uh, dedicated to this Thompson ISI of Science and Elsevier Scopus. And they uh, have each have a set of journals that they access and they record all of the references in all papers published in those journals. So, they provide a very uh, relatively correct set of data for a circumscribed set of journals. Um, so they're rigorous and generally reliable, but they are limited in coverage, particularly in the social sciences. There's been a lot of studies done in it, and in the studies that I did, I typically found that in the social sciences, only 40, between 40 and 70 percent of the papers that were actually published appeared in these um, databases. And in the humanities, it can be as low as 20 to 50 percent. Particularly in the humanities, it's a problem because a lot of humanities work is written in books rather than papers at all. And they are not seriously covered yet. They have started covering books and also some conferences, but catching. So the problem with these sources is that they're okay for science, but they are limited for social science and humanities. The other main thing, again, which I'm going to talk about is Google Scholar, which I'm sure you all know about, which works in an entirely different way by searching the web for all sorts of citations. Um, this is equally good across disciplines in general and gets about 90% of the papers that are published. Um, but it is not rigorous and data is, is very messy. There are many duplications and all sorts of problems in actually doing bibliometric work. Um, it is best accessed, I think, for bibliometric work through Publisher Parish, which is Daniel's website, which software which allows you to access So that's the sources of data. Um, in terms of citations and how they behave, one of the most obvious um, characteristics of citations or distributions of citations when you collect lots of citations is that they are very skewed in terms of statistical distributions, um, what is called the skewness of science. Almost all the sets of citations from whatever source, from whatever collection of papers, exhibit extreme skews. By which we mean there are large numbers of papers that have a very small number of citations, but there are a few papers that have very large numbers of citations. And therefore, they tend to distort average figures like means. This was a set of data that I collected some time ago now of 600 papers from six. Um, Management Science Journals, that's my area, uh, which were all published in the same year. They were all published in 1990. In fact, they were all publications, all journals published in those journals in 1990. And I then followed those citations through in a longitudinal way. But these are the basic numbers at the end of 15 years. So 15 years after publication, um, we can see big differences in the average number of citations that we've been seeing. So draws and only an average of seven. Whereas management science, which is the top four star journal, 38, so it's a, lot, uh, a much bigger number of citations. Uh, and we can also see from these pictures the degree of skewness, some very extreme values. And we can also see the percentage of papers that after 15 years have never been cited. So um, they range from 5% of papers in management science. Now, management science is the top journal in the area. Uh, and yet 5% of the papers published in management science were never ever cited by anybody, even their own authors, after 15 years. So that's interesting. Um, but it actually goes up from 5 to these ones, Jaws and Omega, where there were 20% of the papers are in management science. So quite large numbers of papers were never ever cited. The other interesting thing about it was when you um, followed these citations through the 15 years, to look at how many citations they gained each year, this is about 15 years, this is the totals of citations for all the papers. What this shows is how long-lasting the citation period is. 
it was very unexpected for me, but I was expecting that they would have got sighted for five or six or seven years and then they would become old and nobody would sight me anymore. In fact, as you can see, the number of, they, it takes six years before they reach the peak of citations. And even 15 years later, these papers are still being <coughs> cited at a similar rate, not far off the peak rates. And I don't know how long that would go on for. It could go on for many, many years. And that's very interesting when we look at the uh, journal impact factors in, in a minute, which only take account of the first two years, the non-main journal impact factor, only actually measures the first two years of citations of paper which would be very small in comparison in, in this terms of this particular area. Um, so that's something about citations and how they behave. Uh, basic metrics or indicators for citations. Uh, we can look for a collection of papers. A collection of papers can be papers produced by a person, or a department, or a university, or a journal, or anything really, just a collection of papers. We can look at the total number of citations. Uh, but that is very crude because there are many factors which affect it which we need to take into account if we wish to compare it with some other collection of papers. Um, particularly the number of papers. So if you're looking at journals, then a journal that publishes a large number of papers every year is bound to generate more citations than one which publishes a small number. The other main thing is the field. Um, the science subjects tend to produce many more citations than social science or humanities. And therefore, if you're trying to compare average numbers of citations across fields, um, you can't really do it without normalizing in some way for the field. So that's total citations. The obvious thing to do with regard to the number of papers is simply to find the mean or the average citations per paper, which is called cites per paper, or in some measures it's called impact per paper, IPP. Uh, this is the most common form of measurement, citation measurement. Uh, it normalizes completely for the volume of productivity aspect, and it is the basis of the journal impact factor, the most well-known way of measuring journals. Uh, but it is heavily dependent on the field and also the time limit. Because obviously, the longer a paper has been in existence, the more citations it might have generated. Uh, it is also affected quite heavily by the skewness, which tends to affect means. Um, the third one to mention at this point is what's become very well known, very, since it was developed originally not long ago, called the H index. Um, this is an interesting indicator. What you do is you get your set of papers. You rank order them in terms of the number of citations, and then starting from the top, starting from the paper that has been most highly cited, you work down your list until you reach the point such that you have got H papers, each one of which has been cited at least H times. Uh, so it's a very simple and easy measure to think of. Everybody can look at that and think, oh yes, my H index is 20. That means I've got 20 papers that have been cited at least 20 times. And it's a good measure in some ways because it combines with it both the citation rate that you're getting and also the productivity rate, the number of papers you're producing. Um, so you have to both produce quite a lot of papers and get them cited properly to have a high pitch. Now, there are problems with it as well, as with all of these things. Um, it is very time dependent, so it's bad for new researchers. Uh, so us older lads who've been around a long time have nice high H indexes because we've had many years to generate citations. But new researchers will start off with very low uh, It doesn't discriminate very well, so people can have the same H index, and it also ignores how big the top numbers of citations are. And it's also poor for people who have low volume but high citations. So, uh, for example, Thomas Kuhn, who many of you will have heard of, who created the idea of a paradigm with his very well famous book, Structure of Scientific Revolutions, back in the 60s, he created the whole concept of a paradigm. He has been cited, his book I think has, when I last looked, 70,000 citations on Google Scholar. And he has a very low H index because he didn't produce much else. A couple of other books, few papers, not very much at all. So for people like that who have made small-scale number but major contributions, but on the other hand, it is very robust for data. 
because it only looks at the top few papers if you're using something like Google Scholar, it's quite good to look. So those are the basic citation metrics. Um, before we go on, we need to discuss a bit more this idea of normalization. As I've said, it, it has been found that the numbers of citations that are produced are hugely different across different fields. So, for example, there's a tenfold difference between biology and computing. The average numbers of citations in biology are ten times bigger than in computing. So, uh, it is very uh, improper to compare citation rates across fields which differ significantly in these forms. Uh, so, what do we do with that? Well, there are at least three different ways that there are at the moment of normalizing to that effect. Uh, and there is quite a lot of current debate uh, about which is the best one. It's quite an out of area. The traditional one, what's called field normalization, which was developed and used made, made by Leiden, uh, where they have a big uh, bibliometrics department, um, basically compares the number of citations that papers receive with the worldwide average number of citations for that field. So if you're in psychology, you would say this paper's got 25 citations in this period. How does that compare with the papers we would expect to find in the field of psychology from the same date? And you would then divide the number of citations by the average. And if the answer is one, then your paper is average. If it's above one, then you're above the field average. If it's below one, you're below the field average. Uh, and that's all very well. The problem with it is how do you decide what constitutes your field? How do you decide what constitutes the journals that make up your field to compare your work against? And the way that it's generally done is to use the fields as they are defined in the web of science. So the web of science has uh, a whole set of different fields, and within each field it has a list of journals. Um, and generally one takes those journals as the journals for the field. The problems with that are multiple. Um, firstly, the field lists are fairly ad hoc. There's no real scientific basis or any sort of basis for how these fields come about in the first place. Um, they are very, at very different levels of aggregation. So, for example, if you look at psychology, I think there are 10 or 11 different subfields, each having their own list in the world of science. If you look at business and management as a whole, which is a much bigger field and has a much greater variety of subfields within it, there are only three. So the levels of aggregation are very different, the memberships of journals are very different. So there are a lot of problems in using those web science fields. Um, an alternative, which is a very different way of doing it, which has become popular, is called source normalization or citing site normalization. Now here what you do is something very different. You take a paper and you look at the journals that have cited that paper, or the journals that have cited the journal that that paper is published in. And you look at the list of references, the reference lists in those journals, or in those papers in those journals. And obviously areas which have a lot of citations will have big reference lists. And those references are obviously the sources of the citations. That's why it's called source normalization. And so what you then do is you compare your citation results, <coughs> not with the citations of other similar papers, but instead you normalize them by comparing them to the size of the reference lists in the journals that cite your papers. Uh, and that's very interesting, quite a, a good way of doing it, because it, um, it doesn't require web of science fields predefined, and so each paper or each journal can have its own set of cited journals which are specific to it. And that's useful particularly for, say, interdisciplinary work, or papers that occur in more than one field, because each one can have its own specific um, setting, set of citing papers. Now, there's then different ways of deciding quite how to do that normalization, um, which I won't go into now. A third method that I think is quite interesting is to do it in a slightly different way. It again needs fields, you need to have predefined fields, but now what we do it doesn't involve calculating means, instead it calculates the proportions of papers in a particular percentile. So what you might do for a field, you should say in this field, the top 1% of papers get 50 citations in five years, let's say. And then when you look at the papers you're trying to judge, you say, how many of these papers, where does this fit into that? Is it a 1% paper, is it a 10% paper, is it a 50% paper? So you compare your papers with the percentiles of 
think it is a good. Um, so that's a, a range of different approaches to normalization. Um, if we then move to metrics for journals in particular, uh, I'll go through this section quite quickly. Uh, most well known is the journal impact factor, which is essentially a two year um, citations per paper measure. So you look at the number of look at citations in a particular year to papers published in the preceding two years, and you work out what the citations per paper is. Um, so it's very short term, it only looks at those first two years. There is a five year impact factor, which goes back five years, which is a bit better. Um, but to see here how variable they are between fields, the Academy of Management Review, which is the top business and management journal, um, has an impact factor in the year of idea of 6.17, um, 2011, uh, which is very high for management, that's the top, that was the top one. In science, the annual review of immunology had a general impact factor of 52, um, so massively much bigger. Uh, physiological Review 36 and Nature 31. Uh, there are many criticisms of the impact factor as either a measure for journals or even more for measures of a particular paper published in those journals. Um, it's not normalised, it, it's too short term, and it can be manipulated by journals. Uh, there's been a lot of controversy about <coughs> editors deliberately going out of their way to try to maximise the citations that they get. Um, a second approach, which again has come in more recently, is to say of a citation, let's not count all citations the same. Let us think that a citation from a very prestigious journal is worth more than a citation from a little known journal. And these measures attempt to measure the prestige of the journal who is doing the citing, as well as counting natural number of citations. So they weight more highly citations from highly cited journals. That's obviously rather self-referential, and so they generally have um, recursive algorithms, which in a way are very similar to the algorithm used to generate the page rank in Google itself. Uh, Google itself judges web pages in terms of page rank. And so what they try to do is to uh, iterate around and work out uh, the measure of citations based upon how many times the citing journal itself gets cited. Um, the first one of those is called the Eigen Factor, which is available in the Web of Science. Uh, the Eigen Factor itself is not normalized for the number of um, papers published, uh, and there is a related one called the Article Influence Score, which does normalize for that. Uh, and then more recently, another one called the SJR, uh, which is available in Scopus. So there's actually, interestingly, quite a lot of competition between Web of Science and Scopus because they're both owned by different publishers, so they're both trying to push their own metrics. Um, the trouble with these second, what I call second generation measures is that they're very complex. You can't work out what the algorithms are very easily. Um, they're quite difficult to interpret. I mean, I, in fact, particularly has values which sort of range from 0.06 to 0.01. What does that mean? Who knows? Um, and so they're difficult to interpret, and uh, they also are not field normalised, so they yeah, have those limitations. Um, another more recent, oh, so I'll do the H index. We can do the H index for papers in a journal over a particular time period with the same advantages and disadvantages as it has for individual people. Um, another recent uh, measure is called SNP, Source Normalised Impact per Paper. This is based upon that uh, source normalization or citing side normalization. So it takes the impact of the paper and normalizes it by comparing it with the mean of the number of references in the papers or journals that are cited, paper in particular. So SNP does therefore normalize for both papers and field without having to use the Web of Science field categories. Um, so that's some advantages of it. There are also some criticisms of it particularly technical criticisms of the way that it is calculated. Uh, and then there's other approaches as well. For example, fractional counting of citations, uh, which tends to achieve a similar thing by saying, if a citation for a paper comes from a citing paper which had 30 references, then we'll count it as 130 for the citation. And so it tries to take into account the number of references in that way. 
Uh, there's a lot of work and lot of debate, a lot of uh, different things happening. And overall, I don't think there is one particular measure which can be said to uh, be better in that way in the world. Um, just to finish, uh, Science Metrics does have quite a lot of other things that it does, and I just wanted to show you these because one of the uh, uh, types of things that Science Metrics does is to try to visualise science. Apart from actually counting citations, as I said, if you think about it as a network, um, then there are a lot of algorithms which have been developed for enabling you to visualise uh, the relations between papers or authors or key terms in your area. Um, so this one, for example, is a map of 58 title words which occur 10 or more times in 500 word documents published in a particular journal, European Journal of Law. So this enables you to look at the ways in which particular terms are related to each other. Um, this is one that I quite like. Uh, there has been created what they call a global map of science. So this whole, this whole area here is a map of a whole of the different areas of science in terms of how uh, relations form between these different fields. And what has then been done is to overlay onto that map of science particular um, journal to journal citations, which then leads you to see, and this again is from the management science area, that we get particular um, parts of management science map onto um, particular areas of science as a whole. So you can do a mapping to see how, in this case, journals um, in the management science area actually relate to other parts of science. And you can see that most of it is around here, which is the sort of mathematical end, but then it does pick up all other areas of science as well. Uh, and finally, here's another one in which we look at um, particular journals and how they cite each other. So again, you can use this to try to uh, highlight particular clusters of journals that relate to each other to try to map out different areas of interest within the science. Uh, so apart from it's really just to show another aspect of science metrics. Um, finally, a couple of slides. Alt metrics, which is where things are developing at the moment, as an alternative to citations. There are obviously many other forms of, of ways in which papers get noticed nowadays. Um, keep pressing on that. Uh, there are views of papers, they are downloaded or saved. They are used. Web of Science has now started a new uh, metric itself. When you look at the paper in Web of Science, it gives you what it's called news number, and that number represents the number of times it's been downloaded or cited um, uh, within Web of Science. So there are downloads, it can be the number of times it's been discussed, for example, on Twitter and things like that. Um, I see that suggested a print pack. Factor based on the number of tweets papers have received and such like, uh, the number of times it's been recommended, or the number of times it's been cited. So these are alternative metrics which um, don't quite work yet at the moment, I don't think, because there's not enough databases of them and many papers never get mentioned at all in the social network sites. Um, but nevertheless, this is a direction of travel. And coming back to the beginning again. All of this stuff on citations then tends to feed into evaluation of policy. And I think in order to do that, there are certain minimum requirements which we need, must be met, but which are not yet met, probably. Um, we need robust and comprehensive data, unbiased and effective metrics, um, a proper recognition of interdisciplinary practice. And so uh, we also need to recognize, of course, the fact that as soon as you start measuring something, then it changes people's behavior in order to try to maximise that measure and uh, other ways of coming out. And we also need to recognise that much of the time metrics are used inappropriately, either uh, by lack of knowledge or by deliberate manipulation. Uh, and that's the end. There's a couple of references where you can pick up more information about this. Okay.
five minutes for questions or comments <coughs> or criticism. <laughs> Uh, I have a question. First of all, thanks for the for the talk. Uh, I would like to know if, when you are a member of a panel of uh, research evaluation, you take into account the not only the uh, four-star journals, or but also the impact of uh, the paper that you are about evaluating. I don't know how you do this. No, I mean, firstly, I haven't actually been a member of a panel in the red. I just had to prepare my submission for my department. For your department, yeah. Um, it depends what you mean by impact, really. Do you mean impact in an academic sense, or do you mean impact in a non-academic sense? In a general term. Because, well, I mean, impact in an academic sense can be measured by citations, essentially. Um, its impact in a non-academic sense would be much harder to measure, but that may be where some of these alternative metrics come in. You know, has this created a lot of impact on Twitter? Are you really talking about this paper of mine? No, they're not. Oh, um, uh, but as I said, in the REF proper, they then had this whole section of it, which counted 20%, which is a really big amount, uh, which was about the impact that the department's research had had in real-world organisations. And you had to demonstrate, with evidence, that your research had had, uh, had what they called made a visible difference to the world. So you had to show that the research that you've done had been taken up in some way by an organisation or had affected people in some way that you could document with evidence uh, and led to a difference in the world. And that, that's a very different, difficult thing to do and a very different thing to do. Different thing to do and a very difficult thing to do as well. But quite interesting to me. Thank you. But I mean, I don't know what it is like in here now, but. Most in the, in the UK, most people's CV is when they're going for jobs. They will now talk about citations <coughs> from others. Uh, in business and management, they automatically <coughs> write down the ABS journal rankings of their papers, assuming that they're in the ABS journal. And a lot of people talk about my H indexes, this and so on and so forth. So it has become uh, a fairly standard thing in looking at job interviews, promotions, and all that. Yeah, but as you say, impact is not necessary quality. quality. No, I agree, but that's what's happening because you can't measure, how do you measure quality if it's not yes, yes, but citation is very different. One of the things that uh, I'm responsible to document is the non-academic take up. Yeah. Um, we call it knowledge mobilization uh, rather than your focus which is more on knowledge generation type statistical yeah. evidence. Can you elaborate more about what might be coming in future to Well, I don't know. Well, there's two th th so we're talking here about the impact that research has external to the academic world, so right. the impact that it has out there in some sense. And obviously that's hugely different depending on what your, your field is. You know, business and management is fairly straightforward. You've got organisations and companies to work for. What sort of impact could a philosophy <coughs> have? You know, or something like that. So it's hugely different between different fields. Um, one can attempt to measure it in some way using these alternative metrics, such as the number of times it's been mentioned, the number of times it's been discussed, etc. If you want numbers, uh, what the REF did was to get you to write a little case study. Essentially, you had 750 words to describe what the research was and what the impact was. And then you had to produce evidence for that impact. So you had, for example, if you were doing some effect on a company, to get actual maybe testimony from people in the company saying yes this research has changed the way we do something or other forms of documentation um, for example in in politics you know one of our politics departments um, one of the researchers had been involved in a film about documenting terrorism in a particular country and they could show that their work which was the basis of this film had been viewed two million times and so one could therefore say 
that their impact of the research had actually at least been viewed by two million people. Um, and so that was again a bit of evidence for the extent to which uh, it had had impact. But it was very much, you know, it was, it was the first time we'd ever done it, so nobody really knew what they were doing. Um, and it was very much ad hoc into the particular disciplines and fields uh, which were then evaluated by the re review panel in terms of how it were they reviewed. Uh, difficult to do, but I think that is the way certainly <coughs> in the UK it's going, which is expected that at the next breath, the percentage that this will count for will go up from 20 to 25 percent. So it's becoming even more important. <coughs> and yet the irony is, as I said, that it is an almost uh, opposition to the other part of the left, which is looking for highly theoretical papers. So the left is actually driving in two directions, which are proceeding in opposite ways. <coughs> uh, just uh, 30 seconds. Just uh, as a, a thank you for your turn. As for the future, if you have the possibility to change the system, which are the things you, you, you should uh, absolutely change in the research evaluation system? Well, it will, I mean, part of me wants to say get rid of it completely, which is, <laughs> and we'll, let's see, I just said more or less, why should we do this, it's just a strong thing. But um, being a realist and seeing the way the world is going towards ever more measurement and metrication, I know that's not going to happen. Um, so as I said in a way, for me, in terms of this particular one, I think the biggest thing is to remove selectivity because it is having to be selective about which people you put in and which papers you put in which leads you as a manager to have to make judgments about what the quality of those papers is. And that is the problem because you know you can use peer review, you can get people in your department to review them, which we did, you can get external reviewers to review them, which we did, but they will come up with different evaluations. Yeah. Um, so that's not an answer really. And that's why people fell back on the ABS list, because it was, for all its faults, a set of you know, evaluations which were there almost cast in stone, and everybody could sort of buy into it in a way. And so it's hugely problematic, it's got huge numbers of faults, but nevertheless it provided a way of doing it. So I think if you got rid of selectivity, then you wouldn't have to go through all of those things, and you could genuinely simply say, these are people, this is the research they do, now we want to evaluate it. And, and as I say, the problem then is there's too much of it to evaluate by peer review. And peer review, I don't think, is, is, you know, it is not unproblematic itself. Um, that's why you then need the metrics to help you do that. Okay, thank you.